Good evening, everybody. And uh, this is, uh, as you're all aware, the annual joint uh, lecture that we have between the Royal Society of Chemistry, which I am representing this evening, and yourselves, the CSTC. So may I welcome the RSC people that have been able to come here and those who are joining us on Zoom. <clears throat> and uh, my great pleasure to introduce a, a fellow committee member from the Royal Society of Chemistry from the local section, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Dan Stones, who uh, started off life, uh, or his academic life, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, I don't really know much. Oh, anyway, we won't go into that. <laughs> uh, yeah, his academic life, study microbiology in Leeds um, in 2005. Uh, he then moved down to uh, Nottingham, looking at cancer immunology. Uh, he then moved uh, to Birmingham to do quite a lot of research on, on the various things. He's going to be sharing some of that with us this evening. Uh, he then stayed on at Birmingham. He's now at Gloucester uh, University, the <laughs> University of Gloucester, to give its correct title, uh, uh, at the Cheltenham campus. Uh, and, and he's been working very much on, on cancer type things since then. Um, and we were discussing over a meal this evening. <laughs> The light bulb meal where we discussed bowel canal cancer <laughs> throughout the meal. Uh, but anyway, uh, I hand you over to, uh, to Dan, and he's going to be talking about uh, the uh, recent research on dietary iron uh, with, with the rather jolly title, uh, not to frighten you too much at the beginning. So mm -hmm. over to you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Colin, and uh, thanks uh, to the CSTS and the Royal Society for um, asking me to come and speak to you all this evening. Um, so, uh, as Colin alluded to, um, I've had quite a, a varied career, but the majority of my kind of uh, time in academic research has been spent looking at the interaction between cancer and the immune system. Um, and as I'm going to speak to you to, today, Part of my main research at the moment is looking at how dietary components, and in particular dietary iron, can impact upon that interaction. Um, so just to kind of start us off uh, a little bit um, in terms of some uh, statistics uh, and uh, as a way of introduction, um, although incidence rates um, and uh, treatment um, successes have uh, seen a um, decline in, in uh, cancer, uh, bowel cancer instance and, um, and uh, 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 disease progression to mortality um, in many nations. It still remains a, a really high uh, cause of uh, disease burden um, with around about 2 million new cases and around about mil 1 million uh, cases uh, progressing to mortality um, in uh, 2020. And this is thought to uh, potentially rise um, by uh, 2040. Um, we can see that um, from uh, these uh, statistics from the colorectal cancer um, center, um, that bowel cancer represents the fourth most common cause of cancer uh, and the second uh, most cause of cancer related death in uh, parts of the UK, such as Scotland. Um, and typically, um, the disease affects males um, rather um, um, uh, a higher instance than, than females um, over their lifetime. And typically, um, colorectal cancer is um, more prevalent in people over the age of 50. Um, however, um, Statistics are showing that, uh, and uh, studies are showing that there is starting to be rises in uh, younger populations being uh, diagnosed uh, with colorectal cancer. 
Um, and again, this is very much linked to various risk factors such as smoking, diet, obesity, and the rise in prevalence of, of those factors, um, in, especially in what we term the developing uh, and developed nations. Um, again, your risk of developing colorectal cancer and bowel cancer is higher if you have a first degree relative um, that um, has also um, been diagnosed with colorectal cancer and bowel cancer. Um, and uh, again, the, the rates of, uh, of detection are increasing, um, partly due to a fact of increased awareness and screening um, of, of the disease as well. So what is cancer? Obviously, before I go on to talk about uh, my research, just so that everyone has a, a general idea of, of what cancer is. Um, and essentially, um, it is a uncontrolled cell proliferation that drives cancer to proliferate up and above the proliferation and, and the replication of kind of your normal cell um, types. Um, cancer can also be defined as either being what we could call benign or metastatic. Um, so a benign tumor is one that arises at a site and then kind of stays local to that site. Okay. Um, whereas a metastatic cancer is one that is able to spread from that primary site and invade other tissue. Now, quite often when people think of a lesion or a, a lump as being benign, quite often that can be um, relatively innocuous, okay? But it very much depends upon where that lesion occurs, okay? So um, benign cancers are not always um, benign in nature. They can be also be life-threatening. However, um, for metastatic tumors, those that are able to spread to different sites, they are almost always more serious and more um, detrimental to health than, than their kind of benign or what we call the primary uh, tumors. Um, and I'll go into why that, why that is in, in a, a later slide. So this uncontrolled proliferation of cells and the, the ability of these um, tumor cells to uh, multiply and divide and, and form a, a, a tumor, okay, um, is um, due to many different factors, but particularly important is they result in this uncontrolled cell growth as a result of changes or mutations within the genome of those cells. So this can be through a hereditary gene modification. So one that is inherited from either parent, okay, that can result in an increased proliferation or, or susceptibility to, um, to, to form a tumor. But also during our daily lives, we're also exposed to many different assaults on our on our genome. So our cells have an, an, an innate ability to try to repair and uh, correct any damage that may occur through either chemical assault or radiation exposure, but also even through the normal process of cell replication and cell division errors can occur because in biology, nothing is 100% accurate, okay? And errors can, can happen. Um, and as, as stated, our cells typically have mechanisms to try to guard against that, okay? From being passed on to the new generation of cells, but that can go wrong. And that's what happens in tumors is that they pick up mutations that then damage these pathways and re result in this uncontrolled cell proliferation. So it's damage to particular certain regions of the DNA, uh, the coding parts of our, of our cells that code for the, the proteins that make up our, our cells and drive 
uh, our cells function that can then predispose us to developing cancer. Um, and really this then highlights that cancer is an evolutionary process. Um, it, cancer doesn't just arise from a change in a single region of the DNA or a single gene that controls maybe one event, okay? It takes multiple hits and multiple changes to different genes that control as different cellular functions that then results in what we term a clinical grade tumor from being detected. Okay, so in the normal situation, we have all of us within our bodies from birth have cells that may pick up or develop a mutation in a gene. And a lot of the time that causes the, the, that cell to have um, be less fit, okay? Or, as we'll come to discuss, also be a target for removal by our immune system. And so you have this constant trade-off between cells picking up mutation, slight mutations and then being potentially eliminated or, or just uh, not being as, as fit and able to survive. However, during that process, some cells will pick up a mutation that might make them a little bit stronger or a little bit more able to proliferate than their neighbors and give them a survival advantage. And that then leads to them dividing and being able to divide a little bit faster than their neighbors. And they can start to take over and form what is known as a, a hyperplasia, okay, which is a small area of cells that are uh, hyperproliferating, essentially. And again, they then can, over time and with exposure to some of those um, genetic um, mutations, such as chemical damage, UV damage, or just through the natural process of, of cell proliferation, can pick up more mutations, okay? Until we get a point where we have then a dysplasia and starting to develop regions and numbers of cells that can then be detected clinically. As the, in this scenario, the cancer progresses, the cells continue to change and pick up more and more mutations to key genes that allow them to grow into a larger tumor. And then finally, able to form a late stage tumor um, and form an invasive cancer where they can start to do things like form their own blood vessels and they can start to escape from the primary site and invade and uh, go into, into other tissues. Um, but one of the key things with, with any evolutionary process is that this takes time and it also is dependent on multiple factors, not least the exposure and the amount of exposure to sources of this DNA damage. So the more exposure an individual has to various sources of DNA damage, so things like UV, sunlight, if anybody likes to use you know, the sun, sunbeds at the tanning salon, okay, or lie on a beach, you are exposing, without proper protection, you're exposing your, your skin to increase UV damage, okay? Same goes for other chemical insults as well, such as tobacco smoking, um, and, and we'll discuss um, dietary components as well. So where does iron fit in to, to this? um this topic well iron is an extremely important um element for for cellular processes across all life forms okay whether that be a simple bacteria or our own cells okay the it's it's highly chemically reactive 
Um, it is involved in oxygen transport in your red blood cells to transport oxygen around your body. It's also important in the uh, proteins and enzymes that are involved in energy generation and ATP production in your cells. Um, also, it's involved in the energy generation in um, plants and, um, and bacteria as well. And also, it also forms key um, catalysts in, in enzymes that are involved in DNA synthesis uh, as well. So iron is really, really important for your health and your uh, general cellular processes. However, because of that, its very nature that it is chemically reactive, it can also be very highly reactive and damaging when it's in high amounts. Um, and most, the most kind of um, important reaction that kind of drives this damage is what we call the Fenton reaction, which is this uh, reaction between ferrous iron and hydrogen peroxide. It generates um, ferric ions, but as part of this reaction, it also um, produces quite damaging hydroxyl um, and hydroxyl radicals, um, which can then go on and da cause damage to not only uh, DNA, um, but also to things like the proteins in cells and also even the lipid membranes that, that surround cells. So it can be, it can be really damaging in, in high amounts. And our um, cells and our bodies do have mechanisms to, uh, to reduce and to limit the toxicity of iron okay, within the cells. However, those systems can be overwhelmed. So many studies, uh, epidemiology studies and um, kind of clinical association studies have shown that there is a, a strong link between diets that are high in iron in what is termed the Western style diet and the risk of developing colorectal cancer. Now, I will put in a caveat here to those studies. Um, obviously, a... a uh, when looking at what we term this Western style diet that is high in red and processed meat, there are other factors involved as well. So typically those diet, diets are also very high in, in fats, in sugars, and as kind of, um, you know, as being made popular by um, uh, Chris Van Tolken um, uh, on BBC, also things like uh, ultra process uh, uh, factors associated with ultra processed foods. But there has been a strong link with, with, with especially with um, diets rich in, in kind of red meat uh, as well, compared to uh, diets that are, you know, more uh, rich in, in white meat, such as chicken, um, et cetera. Also as well, um, to kind of go along with the, the diet angle, is that patients that have a hereditary condition called hereditary hemochromatosis, which often leads in, a, in a, a, an iron overload status, so patients have um, increased levels of, of systemic iron uh, within their circulation, they also have a much higher increased risk of developing certain cancers. Um, most certainly, uh, liver cancer um, has been shown in a, in a recent uh, wide-scale study of hemochromatosis patients, and smaller um, studies have also linked uh, this disease with other cancers, uh, not notably just uh, colorectal cancer, but also breast cancer uh, and even prostate cancer as well. Um, although those studies are have been much smaller than the, the kind of more recent recent study. Uh, looking at liver cancer. Um, so there is this body of evidence from epidemiology studies that iron does have a role in uh, promoting tumorigenesis. Um, so one of the one of my so one of the some of the work that I um, kind of got involved with um, during my first um, postdoctoral um, research, studies after graduating from PhD was 
um, in the lab of uh, Dr. Chris Telepis at, at Birmingham University. And his group was, was interested essentially in how this, how iron can directly affect tumorigenesis in colorectal cancer. Um, and kind of before I joined the group, there was a, uh, a clinical PhD student, Matthew uh, Brooks, um, uh, that kind of really set some of the groundwork in how iron might drive cancer um, in the colon. Um, and what he first showed was that when looking at either tissue culture cell lines, so tumor cells that have been isolated from people uh, back in the 50s and 60s and, and kept in long-term culture, but also in um, tumor samples from patients, that colorectal cancers have an upregulation of their proteins that are involved in iron transport and iron storage. Um, and compared to compared to normal colorectal cells. Um, and then further studies then went on to show that um, in tumors that have a mutation in this in a gene called APC, which is a very, very common uh, mutation gene that is mutated in colorectal cancers. It's mutated in around 80 to 85 percent of colorectal cancers. Um, you, when you have excess iron, it drives this key signaling pathway that is usually controlled by, by this uh, APC uh, gene um, and is kind of central in cellular proliferation and growth pathways. Um, and that if you then block this or... Um, uh, or reduce the iron, you can then, uh, it, it then has, has lower growth. And then finally, when, when I then kind of came in and joined the group in collaboration with um, a group from the uh, Cancer Research UK Centre up at the Beeston, Beeston Institute in Glasgow, um, Owen J. Samson and his postdoc, Serena Radulescu, um, we showed that, um, if you increase the amount of iron in mouse models of this um, uh, uh, gene loss APC uh, gene loss uh, model, um, which models a, a colorectal cancer condition in humans called FAP. Um, I won't give the full name because uh, I, I stumble over the words quite a lot. Um, but um, but essentially it's a common familial inherited uh, uh, version where people have a a, a mutated inherit a mutated copy of this of this APC gene, um, and we can faithfully model this in in a in a uh, APC uh, uh, what's called a min mouse model, um, and essentially over time, the mice lose a the functional copy of their APC gene, and they develop um, small adenomas or precancers. In their in their colons, um, and essentially what Serena showed was that if you feed mice their normal diet, they develop tumors after around about a hundred days of age. Um, but if you give the mice diets that is high in iron, then they succumb to tumors a lot quicker, around about the sixty day mark. Um, to the point where they, they get ill quite quickly and you, you unfortunately have to, to, to sacrifice them. And so they generate more, more aggressive tumours a lot quicker when they are on a high iron diet. Conversely, and, and probably in a sense more interesting fact, was that if you then gave the mice a, di the mice a diet that was low in iron, they didn't generate many tumours at all. And in fact, they actually kind of out-survived and outlived their counterparts um, and in some cases form no tumours. OK, so the key thing was that you remove the iron and you have less, uh, the, the mice have less ability to, to form tumours. However, the one 
caveat to that was that if you remove the iron from the diet, those mice then became anemic, <laughs> which isn't good. Uh, um, so they, you know, they 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 survived and they they were healthy, but they 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 were um, had lower systemic iron levels, which is also you know a, a kind of long term health problem. Um, so the 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 question really was, well, is the is it the low iron diet and the the amount of iron sat in the 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 middle of their gut, the lumen of their gut, that drives the tumor genesis? Or is it their systemic iron levels? Is it just that we've, we've removed iron from the diet, they've got less iron in their systemic blood circulation, and that's what's impacting the tumor genesis. So what Serena so then did was then take the mice on the low iron diet and then give them intravenous iron injections so that they are no longer anemic and they have normal <laughs> levels of systemic iron in their circulation, but their levels of iron in their colon is low. And it basically mimicked the same pattern as the low iron diet. So it showed that it's the iron that is sat in the colon and in the gut that hasn't been absorbed, that is then causing the driving of the tumor formation. Okay. So, Along with the, the previous results of, of, of Matt Brooks, okay, it shows that iron, and again, this was also then looked at in, in, in vivo in the mice to show this same pattern of it influencing these key cellular drivers of, of proliferation, that the mice were able to, the, the tumors essentially took in more iron, it stored more iron because, again, the iron is really important for, for those cellular processes in normal cells. So the tumors do the same. They, they sequester lots of iron that then boosts its proliferation and growth. Um, and so that was then shown as well in, in these mice models. But the additional fact is that that high iron diet can also further drive more mutations within the cancer cells. And that really kind of sparked me in terms of looking at um, what else might the, the iron be doing, because for quite a number of years now, it's been very apparent that that tumorigenesis isn't just down to how much the tumor grows and proliferates. It relies upon multiple pathways, multiple genes to be affected. Because when a tumor develops, it develops these mutations, but those mutations make it look different to normal cells. And that is a real warning flag and a sign for the immune response to recognize. Okay. So also as well, as a tumor grows, it gets to a size where it needs more energy, but it needs to do things differently. It needs to form blood supply, um, gain oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. So back in the kind of early 2000, early, well, early 1990s, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, two scientists called uh, Robert Weinberg and Douglas Hanahan proposed um, a theory called the hallmarks of cancer. Um, and uh, this started out with kind of um, six hallmarks being described back in 2000. And then this was updated in 2011 to, to this diagram here, where there are now uh, there's 11 hallmarks. And then it's more recently been updated um, back in two, uh, 2020, I think it was, um, that uh, then there's now kind of 22 hallmarks. So to try and keep things a little bit more um, uh, simple, um, you know, I could spend a whole um, month going uh, talking about these individually. But um, one of the key things and really what I want to kind of highlight with this, this slide is that in order for the tumours to go through that evolutionary process from a single cell that has a bit of a survival advantage all the way through to a full-blown tumour that has invaded into the tissue, has developed blood vessels. 
the hallmarks of cancer have proposed, and, and there's a lot of research around this now to, to support this, is that tumor cells have to develop mutations in these pathways in order to be able to form a tumor of clinical grade and, and detectable size. So we have things like being able to resist cell death signals, changing the normal kind of cell energetics, things like iron storage, for instance, surviving, um, increasing their survival signaling, suppressing growth suppressors. But in terms of then the stuff that I was then interested in coming from a kind of more cancer immunology lab was what effect is this having on how the tumors avoid immune detection and immune destruction? Because it's been known for a long time that um, tumors in their initial stages are susceptible for clearance by various arms of our, our immune response. And one of the things that they have to do to um, escape and be able to continue growing is escape that immune response. And in actual fact, what we also see um, is that tumors are able to actually subvert this destructive immune response and turn it into and subvert it into a pro-tumor, um, what we call tumor promoting inflammation. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of research around how chronic inflammation can drive um, genomic mutations, which then can lead to an increased risk of, of cancer. Um, but also then how this can also then play into things like the induction of what we call angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels, and that process of invasion and metastasis to other sites of the body. Um, because again, research has shown that, that iron can have an effect upon the immune response in terms of boosting inflammation in, in inflammatory settings. So really I kind of started my uh, research whilst I was a, um, a postdoc in, a, in another lab at, at Birmingham University <coughs> and have carried that on in my current research at, at Gloucestershire University. Um, so really, I kind of started with this uh, premise of we kind of know now that increased iron that sat within the, the lumen of the gut and in the colon can directly promote tumor cell formation in the form of, a, a, of this adenoma, and it can boost that cellular signaling. But there was very little evidence and very little data on then how that might affect the tumor cell producing various chemicals and molecules that influence the immune response. And then how that immune response might then play back and influence the, the tumor growth. So really, there is kind of evidence in little pockets of this, but nothing really trying kind of tying this together. Okay, so we, we have evidence that the immune cells are important in immune cell in tumor cell control and you know are a common uh, new kind of therapy angle in terms of things like um, immune uh, immunotherapy and checkpoint blockade. But the the evidence is out of how iron and diet might, might affect this interaction. So one of the key things that um, I'm going to go on to discuss was that um, an early sign was this interaction with a group of immune cells called neutrophils, um, which form what we call part of our innate immune response are and have a real dual role. They, they protect us against kind of bacterial uh, infections, um, but they've also been shown to be really important in um, resolving wound tissue and scarring. Um, and some of those factors have been um, shown to be influential in tumor progression. Um, and clinical data has shown that in colorectal cancer um, specifically, 
patients that present with what we call high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, <clears throat> excuse me, um, or just a general um, high amount of neutrophils, both systemically and also within the colorectal cancer itself, is known to be a poor prognostic factor in colorectal cancer. However, the reason for that um, is still unknown and is still kind of debated. Um, and there is also evidence as well as to the location of where they are in the tumor also has, has potential impacts as whether they are pro-tumorogenic or anti-tumorogenic. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where my, my, my research kind of start, started off. Um, uh, looking at these these molecules. Though the first thing that I kind of tried to start looking at was how does this increase in iron, does it affect the kind of signaling molecules that a tumor produces um, that are involved in, in shaping this immune response? Um, and so what I did was at first, I took various forms of, uh, of iron, both um, iron sulfate, which is a, a common um, uh, constituent of iron supplement tablets, and is the kind of um, Fe2 form uh, of, of iron, um, as well as um, uh, this iron um, component called heme, or, or hemin, um, which is a, a protoporphyrin, as shown here, uh, that contains a ferric iron in its center. And it's essentially, it's readily found in, in red meat. It's a heme ion, essentially. Um, and what I found was that um, specifically, this hemin, this heme form of iron, was able to increase the production of this chemical messenger called interleukin-8, or IL-8 for short. Okay, um, so essentially, the, cell, the range of cancer cell lines was taken, um, and here we just have, have one uh, as an example, uh, were, was taken, they were treated with various concentrations of these uh, iron-containing compounds, uh, and then I looked for the level of gene expression of these genes, and also then the amount of the actual protein that those cells secreted. And what I found on both was that as you increase the amount of um, heme ion, you have an increase in this IL-8 uh, cytokine or this IL-8 molecule, um, both in the gene expression, but also then in the actual protein expression as well. And these are kind of typical concentrations that you would actually find in a, in a diet that is, is kind of high in, in, in red meat consumption. Okay? They kind of 10 to 50 micromolar uh, kind of levels. Um, and one of the main interesting things about this signaling molecule is that it is a potent attractor of this key group of cells called neutrophils that uh, have been implicated in clinical studies as being a, a poor prognostic factor in colorectal cancer. Also, as well, IL-8 has other functions, uh, not just in the immune response, but also can signal back to the tumor cells and also promote this formation of new blood vessels in this process called angiogenesis. Okay? Um, but for the sake of the talk today, I'm going to be focusing mainly on, on what it's doing in the immune uh, reaction. But this is kind of something that I'm currently also looking, looking into. So the next question then was, um, well, okay, these cancer cells are now producing this a molecule that is a potential to attract these neutrophils into the site of the tumor, does it actually do that in rea reality? So to test that, we can test that both in a tissue culture dish in vitro, or we can test it in, in animal models. And so I set about doing, doing, doing both of those. Um, and it just so happens that um, fortune would favor the, 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 the 
more complex in vivo model to work first. Um, and so actually it wasn't until I got uh, went, uh, went to Gloucester uh, University and one of my uh, dissertation students finished this work um, looking at the in vitro um, solution to, to assess this. And, and indeed what we found was that we do have an increase in the migration of these neutrophil cells in response to, to heme ion uh, treatment. So um, what my student did was um, a uh, what we call a, a, a Boyden chamber setup. Um, so you can essentially create a kind of false gut lumen, essentially, using this um, artificial setup here where you have a, a, a well of a, of a tissue culture plate and you line that with, with tumor cells at the bottom. Get my mouse pointer up. Um, and then you can put into that a, a, um, a support structure, um, kind of like a sieve that has a permeable membrane within it that allows you then to, to culture the cancer cells on the top of that membrane, but cells such as neutrophils are able to squeeze through the tiny pores in that, in that membrane but it gives you the ability to separate these two compartments. So what we did was we formed these monolayers, or I should I say we, my, my student formed these, these monolayers, okay, on the upper and lower side of these, uh, these support structures, and then added in the various iron treatments into the lower compartment to simulate the, the kind of inside of the, of the gut lumen. And then they added, the neutrophils into this top compartment and then measured how quickly or how many went from this top compartment and was able to go through the, the cell monolayer here and onto the other side of, of the membrane. Okay, so counting these, these ones that are attached on the side here. And this is what is shown here. So in our control well that just had normal cell culture media with a kind of lowish iron content, you get some migration across, but, but not too many. Whereas if you treat the cells with a positive control, so this is a, a microbial um, compound that is a, a, a potent uh, chemo attractant of neutrophils, you get a strong uh, migration of the neutrophils across the barrier. But if you then include the heme iron, you get this marked increase compared to control. Okay, so it shows that if you treat these cells with iron, with hemin, then you get a chemo attraction of the um, uh, of the of the neutrophils to the uh, to the tumor cells. And then, as as stated, this was actually kind of then backing up some of the in vivo work that I managed to do um, during my time at, at Birmingham and also um, a, a bit of time spent out at um, the University of Texas um, helping my, my supervisor set up her, her, her new lab out there for a few months. But in both labs, we were um, lucky to have access to um, zebrafish um, facilities. Um, and zebrafish present a really nice model to in vivo model to, to perform this kind of work in because um one of the advantages is that um you can use the zebrafish um and they at their early larval stages you can transplant in human cells in what we call xenografting because they don't have uh, uh the the cells of the immune response that are involved in, in tissue rejection, okay? So what you can do as well is that at those early larval stages, they are also see-through. So you are able to look at the cells in live zebrafish without, so without sacrificing them, okay? And be able to obtain that information. Okay, so you can get a lot more information out of a single fish than you can a mouse, which ethically, that's a lot more preferable. Okay, so with the mice, to get the, 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 the results, 
you have to you have to sacrifice them. Okay. Whereas with the zebrafish, as noted here, you, you don't have to do that. Okay. So essentially, what we're able to do is we're able to take um, flore for, for fluorescently labeled tumor cells and xenoplant them in to the yolk sac of the zebrafish larvae at two days post fertilization and allow that tumor to, to, um, to engraft and, and to grow um, for a couple of days and then treat and, or inject the tumor site with either a dose of heme iron or a PBS vehicle control. And then over the initial two hours post injection, monitor the live zebrafish through microscopy. And again, the other advantage of zebrafish is that they are what we call genetically tractable. So we know the, the whole genome sequence of zebrafish and there are multiple uh, what we call transgenic lines. So in our case, in this figure here, we have a zebrafish where the neutrophils have a green fluorescent protein in them. So we're able to essentially track individual neutrophils labeled in green on this diagram here in live time in a live zebrafish okay so um what we can do we can then and what we essentially then did is look at the region that the tumor was implanted into and then count how many neutrophils then come to the site of the tumor either after treatment with heme iron or the PBS control. And what we found was that the number of neutrophils that then come to the tumor when you inject with heme is significantly increased. So again, it shows that higher heme iron within that environment then boosts the amount of these neutrophils coming into the site of the tumor. So, so essentially then, We've built up the ev evidence um, that increased heme iron within the kind of tumor microenvironment then causes the tumors to secrete potent chemoattractant molecules that then increase the amount of neutrophils to the site. But we're still we're still left with well, does that then actually have an impact? Clinical data from the clinical studies have shown associations with high numbers of neutrophils and worse prognosis in colorectal cancer. But in our cases, do, does it actually drive that worse prognosis? And so although um, the data is, is quite small um, in terms of the numbers um, and is still needing to be built upon, some of that early data from the zebrafish models um, does highlight that that might be the case. So um, if these zebrafish were, uh, are left to progress over a few more days, what you then see is that um, the ones that were treated with the Hemin treatment have larger, tend to have larger tumor, primary tumors, but also if you can just make out in the diagram, they start to have these little red tumor cells popping up at other sites throughout the zebrafish. Whereas the typically the PBS control zebrafish had no additional tumors outside of their primary site. Um, I say the data for this is, uh, um, it is on small numbers of fish um, uh, at current. So this is still kind of ongoing, ongoing uh, uh, work, but Early evidence suggests that this might be then is potentially then having an effect on tumor cell spread and progression um, outside of the primary site. So, how it does this has been a kind of um, a key area of research um, of um, mine and uh, others over the past kind of year or so. Um, also, part of this data. Um, also then relies on what effect is this hemin doing to the colorectal cancers themselves. So as part of that study, my, my student Sophie, um, at the time of doing that neutrophil migration assay, 
also could can perform performed a, a kind of assay alongside that where we can measure how um strong that cell monolayer is so how tightly the cells are kind of packed together okay and how leaky that um cell barrier is and it's using this um machine called a um a tur machine which essentially measures the electrical resistance between these two compartments okay so this little probe here that has different length of uh, of electrodes one electrode goes into the bottom compartment and another in the top and essentially it measures the resistance between the two and so if you have a, a very tight cellular monolayer where the cells are, are closely packed together then it has a higher resistance to one where the cells are are more spread apart okay and what sophie showed was that if you then treat with higher levels of iron then the cells do have a lower, tend to have a lower resistance. Okay, so this wasn't statistically significant at the kind of 10 micromolar concentration, but at the, the very high iron concentrations, this was a statistically significant effect. It's also worth noting that the, the treatment time for this was also extended, was an overnight treatment. Okay, so 24, 24 hour treatment as well. So one of the key things uh, that um, I've also been looking at is also the timings of these treatments. Um, and one key factor then is, okay, so we've got less cell um, density or let, you know, the, the um, monolayer is more permeable. Is that due to basically the iron having its toxic effects and there being less cells and they're then dying? Um, because of the toxic effects of iron. And uh, the kind of lower concentrations of heme or the middle concentration, no, that's not the case. Um, they are perfectly healthy um, cells. They are just less kind of bound to each other. However, at the very high concentrations, we are seeing a, 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 an effect on how healthy and viable those, those tumour cells are. Um, so some of the studies that I, I've been doing over the past kind of six months, really, has been looking at, do we still see some of the effects of the early studies at these lower and higher concentrations, but if we even just give the iron for a couple of hours? And what we're seeing is that that is true, even, even at um, four and six hours worth of iron exposure, you then remove that iron those cells then still go on to produce some of these molecules that are involved in neutrophil recruitment, but don't show as much of an effect in terms of their viability. But one of the key things that we're also looking at, and again, I, I've had a student over this past year looking at um, what effects is the iron having on how um, the tumours themselves are influencing their genes involved in attachment and migration to other sites uh, as well, um, in addition to the, um, the, the effects on the immune response. So to conclude then, what we've shown over the past kind of few years is that treatment with heme iron is able to induce these molecules that are involved um, in uh, neutrophil recruitment. And this does res result in an increase in neutrophil recruitment to the uh, cancer in both in vitro and in vivo models of colorectal cancer. Um, and that Hemin also has shown the potential to then increase the uh, amount of this really uh, later stage disease uh, process of metastasis and spread to other sites in vivo. Um, so what we've been kind of really trying to focus on, uh, and I have students literally just writing up their dissertations at the moment, is then what effects then are the neutrophils having at the site of the tumour? Um, it, how are the neutrophils activated? And there's been a student from, from last year and also this year that have been looking at this process um, in terms of how the neutrophils become active. And what we're showing is that, we've been shown is that, that 
tumor conditioned media from the iron uh, treated cells does have a propensity to activate the neutrophils and that activation is releasing potentially releasing molecules that are involved in promoting the tumor um, cell proliferation um, and again we've also been looking at then the actual downstream effect of how that um, affects colorectal cancer cell proliferation and again i've got a, a dissertation student at the moment that's been uh, directly looking at that in kind of quite complex um, what we call co-culture models where we combine the tumor cells the, the neutrophils and uh, and all the treatments together and then look specifically at the what's what effects happening on the tumor cells and early signs I'm, I'm kind of still waiting for his full full write-up and analysis but the the early signs are that um, it is indeed having an effect um, that when you have the neutrophils present along with the iron that you are getting this boost in tumor cell proliferation above just having the tumor cells on their own in in normal media and I've got another student who is looking to do a dissertation project with me uh, next year that is also then looking at how this might also influence this process of invasion and, and metastasis and what the molecular mechanisms are that drive that. Um, and really another key point that I want to go into into the future is um, looking at strengthening ties with local NHS trusts and, and others to really start to look in, in patients, um, using patient samples to see whether there is an association between levels of neutrophils and their um, dietary intake and the levels of iron within their tumors. Okay. Again, this is still not being something that is, is uh, currently uh, kind of unknown and not looked at. So, I'd like to wrap up by um, acknowledging all the people that have kind of supported this work, um, all the way from um, um, my longstanding um, colleague, Chris Lepis and Richard Hollyblow at University of Birmingham, um, whose research um, kind of starts, uh, initial support started me off on this uh, uh, project, looking at iron and colorectal cancer risk. Um, also, the, the host and pathogen interaction lab that I kind of did my kind of final postdoc in and, and really, although um, focused on, on pathogen interactions, um, introduced me to the zebrafish model and their, their utility, um, along with my um, kind of current mentor and, and uh, uh, supervisor, um, Anne-Marie, um, in the University of Texas. Um, and then... A lot of this work uh, as well wouldn't have been possible without the, the, the hard work and dedication of uh, uh, my undergraduate students at the University of Gloucester, um, Sophie House, uh, Christine O'Donnell and, and Kian, um, but also uh, current students uh, as well um, that are driving this project forward uh, in the lab while I'm teaching. <laughs> hey, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm very welcome for, for questions. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Ben, You've taken us right through from the what is cancer to cancer of the colon to the incidence and the prevalence to uh, a model which you've developed showing with iron that it's um, cancer is is progressed by the by this intermediary. And I think you've explained it extremely well. I think you will agree in a very logical and coherent manner of a complex area, no doubt. Um, just a couple of quick questions, if I may, take advantage. Um, the, the absorption of iron from the small gut is, is, is very sparing, isn't it? And it relies very much on things like ferritin and transferrin uh, to take into the liver, I think. Uh, so I can understand that any high iron diet would perhaps leave a lot of residual iron in the gut to go through and perhaps would then be a very likely vector. But what about other tumours, apart from colorectal tumours? Does iron have a part to play in human in this? So um, so there, there is evidence. Um, so um, in particular, things like breast cancer, 
actually, and again, linking back to the, the hemochromatosis yes. Um, yes. conditions. Um, in terms of dietary iron, the, the link isn't so 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 much there, um, but certainly kind of high systemic iron levels have been linked with with other other cancers, uh, most certainly. Yeah. And conversely, does it happen? Can the tumor actually steal iron, perhaps from red blood cells? So, um, resulting in anemia. Possible. Um, so, obviously, a, a a common side effect of many tumors is, is anemia. anemia. Um, and that can both be through, um, in terms of colorectal cancer, you know, um, associated bleeding and inflammation. But yes, most certainly, one one of the key factors and theories behind it is that the iron is able, or the tumors regulate their iron acquisition proteins yeah. Yeah. and then their iron storage proteins yes. and sequester that. Yeah. And so yeah. it leads to that anemia. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Which is, you know, but also an extremely serious uh, yeah. uh, well, problem. Yeah, that's mm. right. And what about other methods? Zinc, copper, other dietary methods that you take in, uh, magnesium, mm. do they have a role to play in tumour? So, generation? So certain um, certain metals, um, the the link isn't as strong, um, but the um, in terms of their their effects on on tumorigenesis, I think um, I mean certain other um, kind of trace trace elements and things like calcium yes. etc. Yeah. can can have a uh, kind of protective role as, as well. Vitamins, uh, possibly. Um, vitamins, so uh, again, especially things like vitamin C um, can be, you know, antioxidants, yeah. for instance, yes, yes. so it can have a kind of protective role um, there as well. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the key things that really implicate iron is, is that very reactive nature of it. So not only is it, you know, shown to be um, promoting the, the signaling pathways in the cell that result in cell growth, but um, that excess, even in the the environment in a kind of normal, healthy individual, can lead to genotoxic events that then cause mutations that then predispose you more to developing a uh, higher risk of developing cancers. Yeah. Finally. You order your steak, should you order it well done rather than rare? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is where, um, my the, the so the, the kind of caveat of, of the research, um, comes into play because whenever you kind of talk about diet, we, we, we don't eat our things in a, in a mono bubble. Um, so one of the things about, um, you know, red meat consumption along with the heme iron. Is that you? Obviously, most people cook their red meat to some yeah. degree, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the degree of cooking can then also influence other compounds like nit nitrous compounds well, that can means. that can also yes. Yes. and have also been shown to be uh, potentially yeah. genotoxic and problematic in their own right. So yeah. Yeah. it's by no means you know taking it as uh, as as a sole factor. Um, what I was thinking was, mm. if you if you cook meat red meat well, you denature the the heme the uh, the mm. heme molecules. Yeah, but made. you also may increase some yeah. of the other molecules yeah. as well. So, well, given and given the the, the age demography of our audience, <laughs> we all have a vested interest in cancer. I think. <laughs> so, I'll throw the floor open to questions. Richard. Uh, yes, I've got a number of questions, as you might expect. Thank you for it. It's great to see the behind the scenes of how you do stuff. Mm. Um, uh, if I can rattle through them. Uh, first question is the big one. Are iron supplements safe? Yeah. Iron mm. supplements are often given, particularly mm. pregnant women. Um, is that a good plan? So, um, so I would say, firstly, again, I would caveat that I, I'm not a, a medical doctor, so always go with the advice of your clinician. Um, but um, uh, one of the key things to, to also note on that point is that, uh, in all seriousness, is that, you know, um, anemia is also extremely serious condition and can, you know, trump the, these, these effects. So, so um, 
certainly I think iron supplementation does ha have its role. However, uh, and you know, obviously in colorectal cancer, people do suffer with anemia and also prescribed iron, iron supplements, iron tablets to kind of correct that anemia. Um, I, I would say that there is research and, and part of the, the kind of research group I was involved in at Birmingham, the clinician side, um, were interested in, in different forms of delivery of iron, um, both in kind of tablet form um, to target the, um, the delivery more effectively um, and increase its absorption so that you don't have as much sat around in, in the colon but also looking at um, various ways to deliver that systemically um, through uh, iron infusion therapies um, to try and avoid that, um, that toxicity. Um, however, obviously that as well comes with its, its caveats, um, not least the fact that you, you have to you know, be admitted into, into often yeah. iron status. So I, I would say um, if you are, what we would say iron replete and not anemic, then there's arguments say that you may not need to take iron supplements um, so regularly. Um, however, if you are anemic, I would say that you know follow the, the supplementation that's been well, given to you. Okay. Um, question: Where did you get your hemin from? Does it come from meat? Um, was it organically raised meat? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so proprietary. I, so I, I obtained it from from a, a chemical called well-known chemical company called Sigma Aldrich. Um, so, um, where where they um, derive that hemin from, um, I'm I confess. So you're, you're assuming that it's a, a pure chemical. It is. Yeah. Okay. Um, do people with reduced iron absorption, for example, celiacs, Crohn's disease, and vegetarians, uh, suffer differently from it? Uh, less so um in terms of vegetarians um the 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 evidence is that they have have lower um risk of of, of bowel cancers um however um people suffering from inflammatory conditions crohn's disease ibs have kind of chronic inflammation which in itself can can result in in genotoxic and, and increased cancer cancer risk. Um, does that answer? Yes, the question? yes, that's uh, very interesting. Um, how does the dose of iron that you were using in the hemin compare with uh, a high meat diet? Or um, so, so evidence suggests that um, it, it's kind of relatively comparable, even at the kind of higher dose of the 50 micromolar um so yeah so the the, the levels of, of of iron in in a high so meat they, they were diet. realistic levels that you could find okay that's yeah, so yeah. you're not always sure with these and things. As, especially as well the kind of the the mouse models that we used in the earlier studies showing direct effects on on colorectal cancer um Part, so part of my my postdoc in in the Celepis lab was actually then kind of following on from that uh, study by uh, by Serena um, to look at ways that we might be able to chelate that iron to reduce the the amount of iron using the various um, forms of um, uh, food additives such as sodium alginates and and others that are known to have natural iron binding kind of properties. Mm. Um, which unfortunately led me to spend a lot of time sampling uh, mouse feces and, and other um, things that I must confess I don't really want to do too much of again. Um, but um, what um, also studies, especially in, in rats, uh, looking at uh, high iron diets and mainly focusing on genotoxic events, those kind of levels are, are kind of the, the standard amounts that, that you would see in a typical high western style diet okay um another question on things like nuts and red kidney beans do they provide iron in the same sort of way as red meat so um not necessarily so one of the the key things as well especially with again going back to the kind of vegetarian aspect is that the iron that's in found in in, in plants is typically in a, in a different form but also 
uh, as well going back to the kind of we don't eat things in a mono yeah. um, uh, kind of situation the 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 vegetables and beans and pulses also bring along with them other molecules that and other kind of food matrices that then impact upon that of iron's availability as well mm -hmm. so whereas the the red meat um iron is typically more available mm -hmm. um but also can be more toxic and bring along with it other elements that can impact upon that um carcinogenic effect yeah. Yeah. whereas the plants and, and vegetables and beans uh don't have as many of those additional compounds as well. The picture is much more complex. It's very whenever we whenever we talk about diet and things that are happening in the gut, it's becoming very clear that things are extremely complex. Right. Um, you know, I, there are other factors such as microbiome as well, the influence of iron and the levels of iron on our gut bacteria that have also been shown to 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 interplay with how we form cancers as well. So yes, the more you delve down, the more Complex. layers of the onion you start yeah, to deal away. Finally, from these, uh, someone called Fred is curious. He would have expected neutrophils to be attacking the tumor cells. Yeah. So yeah. in in some cases and in some tumor types, that is the case. Um, so um, again, um, when when drilling down into the into the immunology, um, uh, you can have your immune cells playing both a anti tumor effect or a pro tumor effect, and it's how the tumor evolves and mutates and then kind of changes that response to promote the tumor promotion effects rather than the anti-tumor effect. So the tumor hijacks the neutrophil. Mm, yeah. Can do, yeah. So um, although not linked to iron, but still in terms of tumor genesis, there's been work, especially in the zebrafish models, looking at melanoma, for instance, that has shown that if you um, have a, um, a zebrafish that is prone to developing uh, melanomas because they have a uh, an inducible genetic um, alteration in their melanocytes. Um, if you take away their neutrophils and deplete them of neutrophils, they don't really form tumors. Whereas if you have the neutrophils there, they they actually come and kind of help and and provide um, signaling to the tumors to help them promote their early tumor formation events. There's some quite interesting research around that, but conversely in other tumors, oh, the opposite is true. And that the neutrophils can attack the tumors and, and, and decrease them. But for colorectal cancer, the, the evidence, the clinical evidence is, is quite clear that especially for kind of later stage tumors, the, the, the more neutrophils you have in your both the systemic pool circulating in the blood, but also um, associated within the tumor microenvironment, the worse prognosis you have. And it, it is actually used as a kind of diagnostic factor uh, in staging and, and uh, prognostic uh, identification of colorectal cancers. Um, I'm sure there's lots of uh, questions from you as well. One, one uh, are you a vegetarian? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so although 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 we do eat quite um, uh, mainly a, a kind of vegetarian diet at home um, uh, for, for for numerous numerous reasons, um, uh, uh, most notably um, dietary conditions of of, um, of my wife. But when I'm out and about as this evening, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, would we'll tip into so, and I think really again just generally things with diet, the old adage of, you know, everything in moderation. Um, if you are eating your meat with two veg, yes, then that veg is bringing molecules with it that are, you know, kind of counteracting um, some of the effects of that uh, dietary iron. And one of the, the key points is that it's 
how long that, di that iron, that excess iron is sat within the colon. Now, one of the problems with people who eat a high red meat, high diet, not very high in fiber and vegetables is that that sits around in the colon for a very long time mm -hmm. and people suffer with constipation. Whereas, and so that has a longer time to, to cause those issues. Whereas if people have a balanced diet and are, sorry to be discussing, he always ends up talking about, about feces and, <laughs> and going to the toilet in this line of research. But again, if people have a, a balanced diet and are kind of, you know, passing feces normally, then that reduces their, their, their risk as well. Cool. Yeah, um, and in fact, it, what I was going to ask is, is related to a couple of these questions. Um, should we be uh, sort of banning all references to Popeye um, <laughs> and, and, and eating copious quantities of spinach and, and green vegetables? But I think you've almost sort of answered this, that the, the vegetables are providing the fibre, so the iron from spinach and, and green vegetables yeah. is not sitting in the colon for so long. So is that, am I oversimplifying um, my own answer to the question? Yeah, I think I think the thing is, is yeah, it's that kind of um, the source of iron and how, how kind of bioavailable it is uh, definitely play, plays a, a part and um, those in you know, vegetables, spinach, etc., are kind of less bioavailable to, to cause this, uh, this this effect. And also, if you are healthy, not iron depleted, you actually I say need quite very min minimal amounts of iron yeah. in your diet to, yeah. to maintain your healthy systemic levels. Um, That's so, 600 mics, I think, to absorb maximum a day, isn't it? 600 yeah, micrograms. Because we're quite adept at recycling our, our, our iron stores. Um, you know, it was, you know, not not taking into account you know things serious events like blood loss or uh, um, things like that, but um, but yes, I, I think you know we should be promoting you know healthy eating patterns most certainly. Um, but whether we need to be downing a can of spinach a day, um, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, man in the uh, brown. Um, you notice the. The um, World Health Organization guidelines on diet around cancer label processed meats as carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know they're very clear about that. But red meat they put as possibly carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's definitely down quite a grade. Um, and I think part of that was because there had been some indications that there might be pathways, but it's not shown in terms of uh, epidemiological studies. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if is it is it the things in processed meat that make it actually more of a so um so I'm not too sure to be honest. Um so in terms of the processed meat compared to um kind of your raw no, not raw, but um, kind of, um, your your beef steak uh, uh, kind of unadulterated from, from the cow. Um, so um, I suppose there's not been much research in, into that, whether the the processing, the the smoking, the, the kind of increased mm. additives that are added in there then um, have an effect on on that. Um, I suppose we're still in the early early days of looking at kind of uh, processed and ultra processed food uh, additives and their effect on gen generally uh, on uh, gut health. Um, but I think um, certainly one of the points is that, yes, that as stated, the, the processing, the cooking of, of red meat, but also then the, the additional processing and the other compounds that are potentially genotoxic certainly can then increase that, that risk, So, uh, which then puts it into that category. Now, I, I would argue that there, there is, a, I think there is enough Kind of mechanistic data there now to start to um, signify that the red meat itself and and the iron itself can can have that kind of pro tumor effect. 
Um, I think it's sometimes very hard unless you do kind of proper randomized control studies to glean very minute data from large scale epidemiology mm -hmm. studies um, because of those mm -hmm. such wide varying factors. So when we say, you know, a, a diet high in red meat, well, they might be high in red meat, but do they also, those people also then have, you know, high vegetable intake along with that? Or is it that they are eating just the processed meats and not kind of the, the less processed meat? So it, it's a lot harder to, to, to gain full insight, I would argue, from the larger epidemiology studies looking at that. The only way you can really tease that apart is, is through proper, fully controlled um, clinical trials, I, I mm -hmm. think. And that goes for, for any really any dietary related. Yes, gentlemen in the uh, blue. So, <clears throat> specifically, you mentioned about the with inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. And um, other than eating less red meat and higher fiber to flush it through, is there anything else that would help those people because of the higher risk to start with? Mm. So, um, so again, so in, again, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's colitis. Um, one of the one of the issues there with saying reduce your iron consumption is that they often present as, as anemic as well. Mm. So um, so that there is there is issue there. Um, so no, I wouldn't say try and cut iron out of your diet completely, but um, there there is the argument to say reduce, try to reduce your red meat consumption, try to uh, increase other dietary iron sources. Um, again, evidence has shown that um, that inflammatory bowel disease uh, increase in chronic inflammation can then uh, increase the likelihood of developing those types of uh, colorectal cancers. Um, but um, but one of the key things is yes, so it's, it's trying to kind of stay on top of and maintaining a, a systemic, healthy systemic iron. Um, it does does trump so um does that answer your question or? yeah I'm sorry. yeah yeah, yeah. So, any more questions um, yes taking malcolm's suggestion of how, how you have your steak mm -hmm. um looking at it without having it rare would you suggest the antioxidants in your associated bottle of red wine would have enough <laughs> maybe maybe yeah, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I've only just uh, kind of got into the uh, the red red wine drinking uh, after having a trip to Tuscany. Um, but, um, um, yes, possibly. Um, so again, another kind of um, uh, part of of research that that um, uh, we and, and and others have looked at is kind of consumption with antioxidants, especially things like vitamin C, for instance. Um, but um, conceivably, <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't <laughs> tested it. Yeah, conceivably, it, it possibly could, but um, I wouldn't be able to say um, yes, because I, I don't think there's been any kind of joint studies kind of looking at that. <laughs> it would be interesting to try. <laughs> Any further questions? Yes, sir. Just very quickly, following on from that, has anyone looked at the difference between grass-fed beef and processed beef? Oh, um, mm -hmm. so so again, um, kind of yeah. pro. That's cool. So uh, processed meat, um, I, I suppose, um, kind of heavily processed. But in terms of grass-fed versus um, kind of more um, feed-based, grain-based beef, um, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah. Um, not to my knowledge, but it might be quite interesting. Why would you think that it would have a an impact upon well, the, the virus and the, and the, and the nature of uh, promoting grass fed, as well as beef? Um, uh, would you think that the 
where some of the grain trade is coming from. So it could be related to the sort of process. So it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I trying to look for a, 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 a better form of meat which I can be about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it would it would be really interesting. I I, I don't I don't know enough about agriculture, um, perhaps and the effects it has on on the quality of the meat to kind of answer that question. But yeah, it'd certainly be something interesting. Um, I think. Yeah. We'll take a final question. Is that I, I, this is a sort of a final. Do you think my grandchildren in 50 years' time will be living in an environment where cancer is not a problem? Ooh. Ooh. Um, yeah, um, a good philosophical question, I think. Um, <laughs> it's so, not a science. Yeah, no, so um, it's, a, it's a good one to have, though, because I think, you know, um, irrespective of you know, cancer rates in certain parts of the world increasing, we're getting much better at protecting, survival rates are, are improving, you know, year on year. Um, so we are in a very good place. Um, I think the one thing that has come out of kind of general cancer research over the last kind of 10 years or so is just how different everybody's cancer is because of that evolution. Um, and as we were discussing over, over dinner, as Colin alluded to, um, the fact that um, treatments are becoming more and more targeted to the individual. So I think that's going to be probably the main uh, driver and, and focus over the next five to 10 years mm -hmm. is that um, increase in what we call personalized medicine so our ability to take a tumor sample, sequence it on a genetic level um, is becoming fast now. We, we technically we're able to do that um, a lot quicker. You know, back in the 90s when the first human genome was uh, published, it took years and masses of resources to do it. Now we have machines that are no bigger than a, a USB pen where we can use to, to sequence a whole genome. Um, I mean, anybody who uh, you know in, you're interested in kind of um, bacterial and, and the um, kind of COVID sequencing, it uses the same technology. Um, uh, uh, but at the moment, that's not prevalent technology used uh, across the NHS. And and we we in the NHS they they look for targeted known cancer associated genes, but in the technology is developing so fast and it's becoming more and more cheaper to do that, that who knows in the next five to 10 years, that might be a standard process. Exciting. Yeah. So not in tumors, but there was a, um, I forget the, the, the exact disease now, but it was a, um, the first um, whole human genome that was sequenced with under 24 hours um, for a childhood, a rare childhood disease, um, which is a life-limiting disease and, and needs rapid diagnosis. And I think it was a group in the States developed this method using this small um, genome sequencing tool to, to rapidly sequence the, the whole genome of, of the child within, within a number of hours. Um, so... Uh, we're a number of years off that, but again, that will also then allow us to, to screen tumours. We're learning more and more that tumours during that evolution process, even within an individual, is made up of many different types of cells. They all have very you know, differences and, you know, using multiple, knowing, understanding more about that and then using combine, combined therapies, targeting lots of different pathways to, to rid the tumors, but uh, whether in five, ten, five to ten years it will be a disease I'm that fifty, uh, 50 <laughs> possibly. I mean, you know, a lot can happen in uh, in even. Of course, years. AI will accelerate that. Hopefully, yeah. it's used properly. Mm. Will accelerate these processes of being able to quickly um, yeah. do complex analysis. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. The introduction of AI as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well done. Thank you very, very yeah, much for the stimulating, yeah. provoking. Well, I can just say it, it's refreshing to find academics who acknowledge the people that have brought them to where they are and also to the people you're yes, taking forward. So thank you for yeah, that as well.